when I started working on this book on the War of 1812 on Tecumseh and Brock three years ago, the War of 1812 was still the forgotten war in Canada. So it was, it was kind of like the war. There used to be this question that they used to ask people uh, who wanted to get athletic scholarships at various universities. <laughs> Uh, what year was the War of 1812? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of people failed. <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, and so it did, it did, now that's changed. People now know about the War of 1812. They have heard of the War of 1812. But I would argue that when it comes to understanding the importance of this war, the significance of this war to us, uh, there's still not a great deal of understanding. There's a great deal of discussion that still has to go on. And so I want to begin um, by making the point that the War of 1812 was Upper Canada's, I'm going to use the term Upper Canada to describe Ontario in this conversation today. The War of 1812 was Upper Canada's War of Independence. Now, we Upper Canadians are odd people. And when we fight a war of independence, we do it oddly. We don't do it according to the recipe of people who fight wars of independence. We do it in a different way. First of all, we do it under the old imperial flag, which is a peculiar thing to do when you're fighting a war of independence. <laughs> Secondly, we let other people do most of the fighting for us. <laughs> we let British regulars and we let native warriors do most of the fighting, although Canadian militia did a significant amount of the fighting. But that's another thing that we do. The third thing, if we look at the, um, if we look at the two greatest heroes, Canadian heroes to come out of the war, Tecumseh and Isaac, Major General Isaac Brock, by, he ended his life as Sir Isaac, but he was not aware of having received the title. He was actually killed at Queenston Heights on October the 13th, 1812, just a couple of days uh, before the note information arrived that we, we always call him Sir Isaac, but it's a title that he was never aware of. Uh, neither of these, neither Tecumseh nor Brock um, was, are you having trouble hearing over there? No. They, the people in the other room can't hear. I just wanna, if, if anything can be done. The, um, neither Tecumseh nor Brock was Canadian. And I want to say at the outset, neither aspired to be Canadian. <laughs> I am not going to be pasting a maple leaf flag on either of these gentlemen today in this conversation. But that's the kind of people we are, we upper Canadians. We fight our war of independence. We do it under the imperial flag. Other people do our fighting. Our two greatest heroes are not Canadian. They don't aspire to be Canadian. That is, and if you're a Tory counter-revolutionary people, such as us, and I say that not in an unflattering way, then that's, what, that's the way it, it, it works out for a people like us. I had the pleasure a few years ago of going to Washington, D.C. to speak in the National Archives there on the subject north of the border, the counter-revolution. That was the title of my talk, North of the Border of the Counter-Revolution. And during my talk, they, they were very friendly, but they were a bit puzzled. They thought they couldn't figure out, is this guy a socialist? <laughs> or is this guy some kind of relative, distant relative of Mad King George? They were kind of getting <laughs> these kind of two things were sort of uh, there for, for them, and they couldn't quite make it out. The second great consequence of the War of 1812, the first consequence, is that we exist and we're having this conversation as Canadians, which is a direct outcome of the War of 1812. If it's, it, we're the kind of country where you may have noticed in the last few days, a lot of people are writing op-ed pieces saying, it might have been better if we'd lost the War of 1812. <laughs> That's the kind of country we are. We're probably the only country in the world, you fight your War of Independence, and then a couple of here, a hundred years later, you think, it wasn't really a good thing. <laughs> Maybe it would have been better if the other guys had actually won the war. The second great consequence of the War of 1812 <laughs> had to do with the native confederacy that was allied to Britain and to Canada during this great war under the leadership of Tecumseh. And for them, this is a tragic consequence because the war, 
that they were fighting, which is a war which was already underway by the time the War of 1812 began, was a war that they ultimately lose. They ultimately lose that war. I call, in my book, I call this the endless war. This is the war that begins decades before Tecumseh is born. It begins when white settlers move into North America and push west, taking native land decade after decade. And during Tecumseh's lifetime, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, that war is fought along a huge front that goes all the way from the Great Lakes through Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, down through the Mississippi Territory, right down to the Gulf of Mexico. So you've got, that is the, 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 the territory that is being fought over during Tecumseh's lifetime. And the result was, first it's important to say what Tecumseh was fighting for. What Tecumseh and the Native Confederacy were fighting for was the creation of a native state. They wanted a sovereign native state to exist in North America that would go down to the Ohio River. It would go from the Ohio River up to the Great Lakes and up into a number of states like Michigan, Illinois, Indiana. That's what they were fighting for in the war, and they have ultimately lose that battle, which is, of course, of great uh, consequence to native peoples in North America. I'll come back. Uh, to say a few words about that um, in a minute. First, I want to talk about the causes of the war. I want to set the stage by talking about why this war was fought and what it was being fought over. Tomorrow is the 200th anniversary of the declaration of war uh, by the United States on Great Britain. Uh, tomorrow is the 200th anniversary of the day when President James Madison uh, signed the declaration of war. Now, why did, why did the United States go to war with Great Britain? There were three reasons that were uppermost in the <coughs> minds of the Americans in this declaration of war. The first one had to do with the searching of, of American ships on the high seas by the British during the decade prior to the American uh, declaration of war. Now, that is because, to understand this, you have to understand that this is the period of the Napoleonic Wars which is the world war of the era. These are the two greatest powers in the world, Britain and France, who are fighting each other in a series of wars that goes all the way from 1793 right up to 1815. And over the course of these wars, France and Britain are throwing everything that they have at each other. And what they're doing is, among other things, stopping the ships of the great neutral trader in the world, which was the United States, on the high seas, and making it difficult for them to trade with the enemy. So you have that going on. That makes the Americans enormously and understandably angry over the decade that leads up to the declaration of war. The second, which made them even angrier, was what is called impressment. This was the practice which was carried out by the Royal Navy of stopping American ships on the high seas to look for deserters from the Royal Navy. Uh, I've got to say a word here about the Royal Navy. Um, it was not fun <laughs> to serve in the Royal Navy during these years. There were 140,000 sailors on the ships of the Royal Navy, and to get people to um, the word enlist is really the wrong word. <laughs> to get people to fight in the Royal Navy, uh, they used to send lieutenants ashore with a gang of ruffian, ruffians in Britain to grab people. Uh, they grabbed young men, up to the age of 55, I may say. They grabbed young men off the streets. If you weren't a gentleman, you weren't already a sailor, or you didn't have any other uh, important profession, they just grabbed you and stuck you on a ship. They then gave you the opportunity to volunteer. <laughs> You're in the Royal Navy anyway, but they gave you the opportunity to volunteer. And what they said was, if you volunteer, we'll give you a few extra shillings. And so we don't really know how many people actually volunteered and how many people were just grabbed and, and flung onto the ships. Here's a statistic that's very important in terms of the Royal Navy. 140,000 men in the service and uh, over 100,000 died over the course of the decade leading up to the War of 1812. 80% of them died of disease, 
Then you have another large group who died because of accidents at sea or falling overboard. 6,000 of them died in battles. That's a pretty small percentage of the total deaths. So escaping from the Royal Navy was a thing that people wanted to do. And the estimate we have is that 10 or 15,000 British sailors probably went and served on American ships. So you have these ships are being stopped. These people are being seized. Sometimes they are then hanged from the yard arm or they are lashed as ways of saying, this isn't a good idea, you shouldn't deserve the Royal Navy. So the Americans are, understandably, extremely angry about impressment. The third cause of the War of 1812, from the American point of view, has to do with the West and with Native peoples. Um, this is the concern that the Americans have is that the British are supplying Native warriors on the Western Front who are fighting against the United States with arms and with other supplies. Now, they're not doing it all the time. They're sort of doing it sometimes, and sometimes they're telling the Americans, hey, watch out, there could be a war, these guys are dangerous. So the British are playing kind of double game on the Western frontier. But that is the issue that inflames Americans. And I want to say a word about what I see as the mystery of the American Declaration of War. If you look at the Declaration, it's mostly about what's going on on the seas. There is a reference, once you get to talking about the West and about the <coughs> natives, I was referenced, and the Americans throughout this whole period use this phrase, the savages on the Western frontier. Incidentally, the word savage, go back and read the American Declaration of Independence with all those beautiful phrases, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but the word savages appears. And of course, what they're talking about is the West, and this again happens in the case of the War of 1812 and the Declaration. What's mysterious about the Declaration is this. It mostly refers to the sea, but the people who didn't want to fight the war were the people who were most affected in the US by that part of the Declaration. New Englanders and New Yorkers were not much in favor of this war. There was even a lot of talk about secession by New Englanders from the United States over the course of the war. Who was keen on the war? Kentuckians, people from Tennessee, whites from Ohio, they were the ones who were keen. And so it, it's clear when you actually look at participation in the war that the part of the war that really attracted Americans to go to, to take up arms was in fact uh, the battle against native warriors and the connection of native warriors uh, to the British. You could, if you want to simplify the War of 1812, it's Canada's war with Kentucky. <laughs> being fought on our side by the British and Native Warriors. Okay, there you have it. I mean, <laughs> kind of the 15 word summary of uh, what the War of 1812 is about. Now, I want to briefly introduce the two men that I talk about in my book um, in more detail before we go on to look at what they did in the War of 1812. They are first Tecumseh and then Isaac Brock. Tecumseh was a Shawnee warrior was a Shawnee uh, uh, who was born in a village near the Ohio River in 1768. Now, it, if you pick a certain date and place to be born, that has a great effect on your life. So it was with Tecumseh. If you were born in 1768 or 1769, you had a very good chance of participating in the War of 1812. The Duke of Wellington, Napoleon, Brock, they were all born the year after Tecumseh was born. Born at the right time to be in that war. Also in exactly the right place because he was in the line of fire of American settlement moving down the Ohio River, occupying Ohio during this period. And three times at least during his childhood and early, early teenage years, he saw his villages, the village that he lived in, burned down by the big knives um, or the settlers and their armies over the course of uh, his childhood early uh, period of being a teenager. So he grows up in the line of fire. And Tecumseh dedicates his, uh, himself to the fight um, to stop this process. In other words, what he is saying is we are not going to have our land taken away. We are not going to be played off against each other. 
Um, he uh, builds, over the course of his adult life, a great confederacy of uh, native peoples who speak different languages, who have often been enemies in the past. And his confederacy takes you all the way from the Great Lakes in the north down through Ohio and Kentucky, Tennessee, right down to the Gulf of Mexico. It's quite extraordinary um, because what he, has, what he does over a period of several years is to travel this country and to bring more and more peoples in. And he's saying, here's what he's saying. He's saying no a tribe has the right to sell land. They can't sell it to each other. They can't sell it especially to strangers. And then he, he says the Great Spirit created the land for all. And he's saying the red man has to stand up and has to fight this battle. This, this is basically what Tecumseh is saying. And over the course of these years as an adult building his confederacy, he warns the United States. He gets together with people like William Henry Harrison, who is the governor of Indiana, the future uh, president of the United States, and he says to them, if you don't give back the land that you've taken, there is going to be war. Uh, I'm warning you. I'd be happy to make an alliance, he says, with the United States, but you have to understand that this is what we've done. We have put together this alliance of peoples, and this is what we are intending to do. So war, if necessary, is going to be fought. By, by 2010, he has made that warning, and he has, and by the time you get to late 2000, uh, sorry, 1811, I'm, I'm sorry, living in the, <laughs> moving forward. Um, 1811, he has, a war has already broken out between the Native Confederacy and the United States. It does so at a battle that is called the Battle of Tippecanoe, where Tecumseh's brother, also known as the Prophet, fights against uh, an American army. Uh, later, Henry, uh, later Harrison uses Tippecanoe as his slogan to win the White House, which he finally does, uh, the slogan Tippecanoe and Tyler too, um, fighting and defeating and uh, carrying out uh, successful attacks against native people, sometimes genocidal, was a way to success in American politics in the first half of the 19th century. So that's what, um, that, so you already have that war going on. That chapter of the endless war is being fought by the time the War of 1812 breaks out. The other person I talk about in this book is Isaac Brock, who is a very different person. Isaac Brock was born in Guernsey off the coast of Normandy. Now, it's, Guernsey is an interesting place. Guernsey and Jersey are, by the 18th century, are um, islands that are very much commercial islands. They're kind of in the lead in terms of capitalism, quite different from aristocratic Britain. It was a kind of place where you had you know, legal piracy, you had commerce on the high seas, families like the Brock family, leading family in Guernsey, were people who were probably involved in both piracy and in commerce on the seas. Um, Brock was, from the earliest uh, days of his life, dedicated and devoted to the British Army. The British Army was Brock's life. Brock managed, and in those days, if you were a gentleman, you bought um, ranks, you bought uh, positions, and then you moved up, and then you bought a higher position as time went by. Ultimately, of course, he becomes a major general. Now, Brock, um, during uh, his, in his early service in the military, managed to fight in the Great War against Napoleon. He does serve briefly. Um, in battles in the Netherlands against uh, Napoleonic armies, but he is quickly sent by 1802 to Canada. Now, if you are um, an ambitious officer in the British Army in uh, the early 19th century, the last thing you want to do is get sent to Canada. <laughs> you know what? What do you want to go to Canada for? I mean, the big show is in Europe. You're fighting Napoleon. That's the place for advancement. He gets sent to this horrible, awful frontier in the British Empire. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, document the terms 
horrible and awful in a minute <laughs> when I described the way he looked at the place. He was, a, he was an officer who came to Canada, spent the last ten years, with, except for one short break, in Canada. And what he was doing from the beginning was building the, Canadi the forces, the regulars, building the, the defenses on the uh, lakes, building the Canadian militia, building the alliances with native peoples, so that if war came with the, from, with the United States, we would be ready, Canada would be ready. But there's no question, you read his letters, and he was a man, uh, incidentally, if you were a British officer in this period, I have to hand it to him, um, British officers in this period had very fine penmanship. And I can attest to that because I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of letters that they write to each other. So he's always writing people back in England saying, maybe somebody can get me out of here. <laughs> I'd like to go somewhere more interesting. When the wives of uh, some of the officers arrive, he kind of writes about them as, you know, here at last we've got these interesting women who've come, arrived, and um, uh, what am I going to do? He actually gets a letter in 1811 from a colonel, right, a friend of his, writing for Britain, who says, you are having such a stupid, dull time <laughs> there in Canada. And he says, but you must not marry anyone there. <laughs> These people are not up to your level. And you must not marry any of the people from there. And then he says, I have a, a large number of daughters. He doesn't specify how many. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, if one of them was old enough for you, I'd be very glad to have you marry her. But there's the advice. The advice is, you know, you poor guy, there you are, this is the situation. All right, I've set the stage. The war, the war is declared. A few weeks later, William Hull, who is the American general at Detroit, leads American troops onto Canadian soil in the first invasion of Canada. He crosses the Detroit River into the southwestern corner of Upper Canada. Now, one of the bad things about winning a war is that it mean, you're not well set up for the next war. And the Americans won the war, the, their war of independence, but by the <coughs> War of 1812, the heroes of that war were old. And not as old as me, but they were old. <laughs> and so it, what tended to happen was that the Madison administration appointed all these old guys to be generals. They had nicknames like Granny. They were <laughs> far past. Uh, their best days as uh, military leaders. And William Hull was a hero of the Revolutionary War, but he was a guy who liked to just sit at home and eat with his family. And he was tremendously fearful of Native people and of Native warriors. So there he is in Detroit. He leads these American forces on, onto Canadian territory. He's greeted by a number of people who's, who come to welcome him, and, and it looks like he's going to get a lot of support. Because don't forget, a large part of the population of 100,000 people of European descent who live in Upper Canada in this period come from the United States. Some of them are genuine loyalists, but a lot of them are people who came later and all they were really interested in is getting cheap or free land. Not much loyalty, a lot of fluidity in terms of political loyalties in this first part of the war. Now, like good Americans invading another country, incidentally, we have the honor of being the first country that the United States invaded after it became an independent country, we were first. Um, they, um, they issue proclamations. Now the proclamation we got was one in which uh, William Hull said to Canadians, he said, you now live under the stars and stripes that flows over your head. And he said, I bestow upon you the benefits of civil, religious, and political liberty. And then, but. Okay? <laughs> it's the trouble with these proclamations. It starts off pretty good. Then it goes on to say, if you, it, it goes on to say this, any white man fighting side by side with an Indian will not be taken alive. Instant destruction will be his lot. Okay? You fight with the, uh, side by side. And then he goes on to say, if you fight side by side with native warriors, this will be a war of extermination. That's the phrase that he used. Okay, so, well, <laughs> terrific. All right, it sounds good, and then you get to the bad part. <laughs> now, about 10 days later, Brock issues a counter -pro proclamation in which he says, um, ignore this talk. 
from General Hull, the, the uh, aboriginal allies of uh, and subjects of His Majesty have as much right to their land as anyone else. Um, and we are going to fight side by side. This is what Brock says a few days after uh, Hull issues his proclamation. Now, at this point, the war is flu very fluid. It looks with, with quick action. The United States could have won um, in southwestern Upper Canada. They could have grabbed Fort Malden, which is the big British base. Tecumseh is already there with, his native, with native warriors fighting against the Americans. Things are beginning to turn. It's beginning to look like this battle won't be so easy for the US. Brock sets out in early August of 1812. He arrives at Fort Malden on August the 13th, 1812. The first thing he wants to do is meet Tecumseh. So these two guys size each other up. They look at each other and they, eat, they realize that they each bring something to the table that the other can't provide. You've got the British regulars with their cannons, with their steady uh, firepower. You have the native warriors with their tremendous ability to fight um, an open, fluid battle in the woods. Um, and you, and they, they size each other up. To, Brock says, I want you to teach us how to fight here. And you, you quickly get, and this is what, what's quite fascinating, you quickly get a decision by these two warriors to say, let's carry out an immediate attack on Fort Detroit. They have half as many men as the Americans. Mm -hmm. The fort is well built and well protected, well constructed. All the British officers are against it. They think it's crazy, you don't do this kind of thing. But they set out. Um, and over the next couple of days, the native warriors cross the Detroit River, British regulars cross, Canadian militia cross, and they carry out the siege of the fort beginning on August the 14th. And um, they use some tricks to scare. Uh, psychological warfare is important in a situation like this, especially when you've got a fearful guy like William Hull sitting there inside the fort. And so what they did first, they got Tecumseh's warriors to go back and forth in front of the fort many times to make it look like there were a lot more native warriors than there actually were. <laughs> and this, he increasingly fright, frightened as he sees this. The other thing they did is they got the Canadian militia to put on the uniforms of British regulars because the Americans were afraid of British regulars. And so it looked like there were more, much many more of them. On August the 16th, Tecumseh and Brock go up to a hill overlooking the fort to decide what are we going to do next. They look down, the fort door opens, a horseman rides out with a white handkerchief. <laughs> it is the son of the general. He couldn't get anybody else to do it. <laughs> uh, he rides out and surrenders the fort. So on August 16th, the United States surrenders Fort Detroit, which is a huge victory for the British and for the native warriors. Because what it does is it throws the United States back on its heels. The Americans are thrown back on their heels. Jefferson had said that conquering Canada would be a mere matter of marching. And in the early days of the war, enthusiasm for conquering Canada became huge among the top American leadership. People uh, like Madison, people like Henry Clay from Kentucky, we're all assuming Canada is going to fall, Canada is going to be conquered. The battle at Detroit changes that. Because what the battle does is it says this is not going to be so easy. And it changes the thinking of upper Canadians. Because they begin to think this war may not turn out the way that we had thought it was going to. It is, in my opinion, a turning point um, in the history of the continent. It does have that effect. It does change the course of the war. Now, over the course of the war, um, over the course of the war, um, you have, of course, the deaths of both Brock and Tecumseh. They both die on Canadian soil. Brock dies at Queenston Heights uh, on August the 13th, 1812. Now, Brock was somebody, um, and I say this in sympathy, but nonetheless has to be said, he was the kind of guy who was kind of lining up to get killed on a battle battlefield. He always insisted on wearing the big red uniform with the epaulets on the shoulders. He was six foot three. Um, now, I don't want to take away from the Hollywood, in case Hollywood wants to shoot a movie about this, 
I'm going to reveal one thing to you. He had a 47-inch waist. Now, according to one Guernsey uh, historian I met when I said this to her, she said, yeah, but you have to take into account you need a loose-fitting jacket when you're fighting um, on the field, so don't draw too many conclusions from that. But he's the kind of guy who sharpshooters, and the Americans had plenty of good sharpshooters in all their armies, dating back to the War of Independence, who was going to get picked off. And of course, finally, that happens to him on August the 13th, 1812. And Tecumseh dies the following year, almost exactly a year later, August the, on October the 5th, um, 1813, dies at Moravian Town near London, Ontario, um, again uh, in a battle. Uh, this time, the Americans have reinvaded the southwest corner of Upper Canada uh, after winning a big victory on Lake Erie. They're pushing up the Thames River, and uh, he dies in that battle. So, of course, we don't know the answer to the question, what would have happened if these two um, leading figures had survived the war? We do know that Brock understood and supported Tecumseh's war aim, which was to recapture native territory from the United States. We know that. Now, whether that would have made any difference had he been alive when the diplomats are getting together in Ghent, we don't know. I mean, let's face it, when it comes to negotiations, the British were going to negotiate what was in their imperial interest, whether they would pay attention to kind of a deal between two warriors on a field of battle who understood each other, that's quite another matter. And we can never, of course, know the answer to that. Now this war goes on, as you know, goes on uh, to the end of um, 1814. Um, and over the course of the war, um, there are battles fought on, and won and lost on both sides. There are also serious atrocities by both sides in this war. One of the first uh, big atrocities in the war uh, occurs when this city, uh, this town, uh, the town of York, uh, now Toronto, was attacked by the Americans in April of 1813. The Americans come ashore. The British fight, incidentally, Fort York I'm going to be speaking there on, on July the 4th, but Fort York did not have a glorious, if I can put it this way, and not a glorious fate as a fort. It kind of hung on for a very short period of time. Then the uh, powder magazine in it was blown up, and actually quite a few people were killed, including General Zebulon Pike, uh, after whom Pike's Peak in the United States is named. He died, and he was a rather honorable man who, uh, when he led his troops ashore, he said, uh, we're not going to have, there will be no atrocities against Canadians or seizing of their property. These people are innocent uh, victims um, in this war. He is killed um, in the war. Um, but the Americans do carry out atrocities in this town of York. They burn the governor's house. They burn the parliament building. They seize the library books. Um, and a guy who became <coughs> a big hero for me, I wasn't necessarily expecting this, was John Strawn. Now, we all know Bishop Strawn of Toronto, rock rib Tory, member of the family compact, as conservative as you can be. Mm. Here you've got John Strawn. When the Americans are occupying the town and the British soldiers have left, he is running around bugging the top officers. He is bugging them and saying, you're committing atrocities here. You've got to stop this. And he is annoying and annoying and annoying them. Uh, he's also interesting because he's a guy who writes letters back to England talking about the great bravery of Tecumseh, the right of native people to their land. Meanwhile, you know, you've got this conservative doing this in Canada. Meanwhile, Thomas Jefferson, the great liberal, is talking about savages on the western frontier. This, it's a war that kind of uh, changes, um, uh, it, it plays with your head uh, when you're looking at the War of 1812. So that takes place. Another great atrocity that occurs on Canadian soil occurs in December of 1813 when the town of Newark, now known as Niagara-on-the-Lake, was burned to the ground in uh, very cold weather and uh, women and children died in snowbanks there. Some of the people who perpetrated that were a company of Canadian volunteers who had gone over to the American side. But this was cleared at the highest levels that this attack on Newark could take place. Now, the atrocities are not all on one side by any means. Once you had the attack at Newark, you had the immediate response of the British going across 
and burning down communities uh, on the other side of the Niagara River, like um, Buffalo, like Black Rock, and killing soldiers, American soldiers, uh, for no reason at Fort Niagara. So you hit back. There's atrocity on one side, an atrocity back on the other. The most famous atrocity, the, the atrocity we all know about, is of course in uh, the summer of 1814 <clears throat> when the British occupy Washington uh, after a brief battle outside Washington, at which incidentally the top leadership of, the American, of American politics, they were all there uh, for the beginning of the battle. This is kind of one of these unusual situations where you got the President, you got the Secretary of State, you got the Secretary of Defense. They're all there at Bladensburg. Um, uh, Madison, who's a very, very big constitutional figure in American history, um, it showed up and he had a brace of, he was a very short, little tiny guy, had a very tall, beautiful wife, Dolly, but he was a short little guy. He shows up with a brace of, brace of pistols and he kind of stays there for a while and then says, we're going to have to leave it up to the military leaders to carry this thing out. The British, of course, occupy Washington and then they burn down the Capitol, they burn down uh, the White House, they go and burn down government offices and buildings in Georgetown, so, and they use the, bur the attack on York the previous year as their excuse. Now this, of course, is a very famous set of incidents um, that have been written about over uh, the course of the past two centuries. They then go on to attack Baltimore, fail to, uh, uh, to, attack, to capture Baltimore, but there at Fort McHenry, um, they, uh, they attack Fort McHenry from Chesapeake Bay, and it's there that the American National Anthem is written. All that stuff about bombs bursting in air, <coughs> rockets right from there, uh, our flag was still there, etc. That's all from the attack on Fort McHenry um, in the late summer of 1813. So the war finally ends um, with a peace treaty on December the 24th, 1814, signed in Ghent in what is now Belgium. And the result of the war is this. First, and this is of exceptional importance, the British take the demand for a native state off the table. It had been on the table for a long period of time, the demand that there be an independent sovereign native state, which of course is what Tecumseh had been fighting for, he has now been dead for over a year, uh, but the British take that off the table. When you read the treaty uh, that ends the war, the Treaty of Ghent, all it says is we're going to go back to the period before the war, back to 1811, and the conditions that prevailed between natives and the U.S. government and the British government on one hand, on the other hand, uh, at that time. But there is no, the native state has disappeared. In effect, what that means is that the British have decided that they are no longer going to play any kind of role in terms of what the United States does on the western frontier with native peoples. The U.S. becomes free at that point uh, to do what it likes. If there's a very interesting book that was written by Thomas, uh, or, or by, by uh, sorry, Theodore Roosevelt in the 1880s. He wrote a very good book on the Naval War of 1812 long before he became president. It's quite worth um, a look at. You can easily get a copy of it. And in this, he describes Tecumseh as a great hero, but he says, with the removal of Tecumseh and with the, with the uh, peace treaty, the door is open. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt engaged in quite a lot of what I would call racial um, uh, uh, ways of analyzing society. He said the door was open for our race, the Anglo-Saxon race, to move across the continent. In other words, uh, this is the outcome of this war. So this is, so that, uh, that's one outcome. The other, of course, great outcome is that the border between Canada and the United States, now there were border issues that continued after that, some of them even serious, but the basic border that had been established at the end of the American Revolutionary War stays exactly in place. The United States had fought to change that, that was not changed. And when you think about borders in the world, we are used to the fact that we have lived next door to the U.S. for two centuries and the border has remained the same over that course of time. Many borders in the world have changed over the course of the past two centuries. So this is now one of the world's longest and most securely established borders over a long period of time. 
And so the other consequence, along with, of course, the consequence for the native peoples, is the consequence that instead of having one great continental state north of the Rio Grande, there are going to be two. One of them surely more powerful than the other, but nonetheless two great continental states. So in that sense, the War of 1812 plays an enormously important role in um, the existence of Canada today. Now I'm going to I'm going to conclude these remarks and then open this up for questions in a second. I'm just going to leave you with a few uh, little questions and uh, that I uh, kind of get into in the book that I think you might find um, interesting. Um, one of them is, why do the Americans always think they won the war? This for me is interesting. You, you declare war, you get none of your war aims met. Why? Well, I think Johnny Horton's song, but there are people here in this room old enough. My, my kids, you know, back, you know, they all you know, down the mighty Mississippi, maybe some people sing it. Anyway, back, in, if you're old enough, you're going to remember this song about the Great Battle of New Orleans. There's only one problem. They won a huge victory. It, the war was over by then, and it had no effect on the outcome of the war. Um, the other is, I guess, the Americans tend to think they, you know, they always say they won the war. I, I think that is a, and maybe that's not a bad idea. You just sort of, at the end of war, you declare that you won. Um, <laughs> now, in fact, all right, so that's one mystery that I kind of delve into. A second mystery is, did um, Isaac Brock have a relationship with an 18-year-old woman by the name of Sophia Shaw uh, or not? Um, did he, in other words, violate the... Uh, advice of his friends back in England, don't marry them, they're below your level. And on the last day of his life, did she, <coughs> as he rode to the point where he died, uh, did meet him as he was riding his horse, did he get off the horse <coughs> and accept a beverage from her? <laughs> now I have met, she was 18, he was 43, I have met a, a, a historian, a woman, fine woman in Guernsey, uh, Gillian Lenfisty, who said to me, oh, forget it. There is no way that General Brock had a relationship with that young woman. She was just a uh, star-struck teenage girl who <laughs> thought she was having a relationship with the big general, so you could just ignore her. So, but anyway, a lot of discussion about that, and I delve into this question. Uh, another question is, where is Tecumseh buried? This is a matter of some uh, great discussion, and I uh, discuss this in the book. And finally, I'll leave you with this uh, query that I raised uh, before, which is the, the state of the American generals during the war. Why did they, if I can use a military term, do so much fetching <laughs> during the course of the war? They, if you, you could write a book. There's a, I, I suggest this. So some, somebody want to take it up. It's a good subject. A book about uh, American generals writing books about each other after the war, justifying all the mistakes they made and blaming it on somebody else. You see, there was a tremendous, tremendous literature there. Now, by the way, the British generals hated each other equally, but they didn't write books about it. They used <laughs> stiletto methods. They silently did each other in, but it was not uh, this kind of thing. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.